Okay, hello chemistry students, I'm Dr. DiVincenzo and uh, this is going to be your first video for this is General Chemistry 1 and the idea of these videos is that you should be watching these before you come to class and have a lecture on them so that's going to be key. They are basically designed to be a streamlined look at what is in the chapter focusing on fundamental basic concepts that will help you get more out of the lecture. I hope to spend less time on some of the basic fundamental stuff that you can learn from the textbook and from your reading, reading and from other sources with the hopes of spending more time in class uh, dealing with you know complex issues, uh, concepts, and working problems. So this is your first uh, video and these videos are designed to be a max of, uh, of about 25 minutes, anywhere from about 15 to 25 minutes. And I'm going to give you an overview of some of the fundamental concepts. Advanced concepts will be left for the classroom. So this is to give you an idea of what I need you to come into the classroom prepared to ask questions about if you don't understand or to have a background in, if you will. So this is chapter one, and this is matter and energy, an atomic perspective. So really, a couple things I always tell my general chemistry one students is that this is just an example of the types of problems that have nothing to do with chemistry, quite frankly, that you should be comfortable with. And that is the mathematical skills you need. And I always tell my students, if you're good with word problems, you'll be good with the mathematical portion, portion of general chemistry. And I should throw into there algebra also. That's going to be the two key things. If you can do word problems and algebra, you're in good shape. So what I want you to do is take a look at these on your time and see if you can answer these questions. And the first one is simply a recipe for making pizza, and it tells you that five and a half cups of flour makes two pizzas. The question is, how many cups of flour do you need to make 37 pizzas? It's a very simple calculation, uh, but think about how you set up that problem, because that very concept will be used quite frequently in chemistry. And if you remember how simple it is, it really becomes that simple for a lot of your chemistry problems. The next one is a calculation that you might see in chemistry. You could see it in physics too. It's basically just a velocity type or distance time type calculation. In this case, you're asked to convert between two unit systems. So here we've got 1.6 kilometers in a mile. That is the conversion that I'm giving you. And I'm telling you the car is traveling at 35 miles an hour. My question is how long does it take the car to travel 127 kilometers? So you have to do a conversion there to get them into the same units, but I'm giving you that factor. So see if you can solve that problem. The next thing here at the bottom is the algebra. And I simply want to see if you guys are capable of just simply rearranging a simple equation like this. And what answer you get. Then I want to see if you can arrange something a little bit more advanced like this. And there is an equation very similar to this in general chemistry. So if you can do that to start with, you can solve this page to start with, you're in pretty darn good shape. And we can talk about this in class as we need. Here are the learning goals, the actual specific learning goals for the chapter. I'll give you this for every chapter that we, uh, that we cover. And I will ask that you ultimately go back to these learning goals and make sure you're comfortable with them by the time the exam comes along. So you're going to need to master basic terminology, um, define and understand components of the scientific method. Of course, you're going to see this in any science course. Familiarize yourself with this framework. This is something your textbook uses and it's developed. I never heard of this when I was a chemistry student, but this is called COAST. And I'll explain what that means when the time comes. But it's a, it's a framework for helping people that struggle with solving problems to go about them. If you struggle with word problems, you know, taking these types of steps can be helpful. And then applying that framework of solving problems um, and dimensional analysis, which is where we're going to look at units and conversions, to be able to calculate temperatures and be able to do basic unit conversions. That's really the learning goals for this chapter. 
So here's a list of definitions, and these are things that you should really jot down if you don't know already as you go through the textbook, and as you look at my slides online, and as we go through lecture. I'm not going to spend time in lecture much talking about these concepts, because your book does a fine job, and they're all basic concepts you can grasp by simply Googling them or going to Khan Academy or reading your textbook. Any of these things will suffice to give you solid definitions for any of these concepts here. Here's the actual outline of your chapter. So these are different sections that we'll be covering all of these. We'll spend more time on some of them. This one right here, you know, I basically got to have one slide on it just to introduce it to you. There's no reason to really uh, go into any grave detail here, and, and, and let's wait for when we actually need to use that. Um, so particles of importance here are a couple of definitions, atom, element, compound. Once again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can get this from your book. I want to point out a couple of things that a compound, two more elements chemically bound together. That is key. Okay? It's going to be key when we want to distinguish between something like a mixture. When we say chemically bound together, it means we're going to have to require energy to separate things. And we're actually going to, in the process of that separation, really effectively change what the, the substance is, right? I mean, if I have carbon bound to oxygen and I'm going to separate that, it's no longer going to be carbon dioxide, it's going to be individual carbon atoms and oxygen atoms. So that's one of the keys to distinguishing what a, what a compound is. The scientific method, of course, this is something that you'll always be exposed to in a scientific class. So we'll talk about this in some detail in class. Mainly what in class, what I want to focus on is theory. And I want you to take a look at, really, if you can get a grasp from reading, what the difference is between a theory and a law. And that's commonly misconstrued in textbooks, and, and there's often uh, misconceptions among students. But it's important to realize the scientific method is just a, a process you go through in developing, you know, a, a theory or law about a particular set of data or observations and things like that. And it, it's important to realize it's not just used by scientists, something that's used all the time. You might not call it the scientific method, you might not have names for it like hypothesis and, and recognize it, but effectively you're, you're using this all the time. And a hypothesis really fancy word for an educated guess. That's really all it is. A law is usually very concise. It can be mathematical often, but not always. These are some definitions I want you to just read over in the textbook. Um, they, they have slight differences in their meanings, and, and obviously some of these things within these, these laws are somewhat obvious now, but you have to realize that these were developed, you know, hundreds of years ago. So, um, this is just saying that the compounds always contain the same proportion of their component elements. Okay, so if you have H2O, we can always be in the same proportion of hydrogen to oxygen. Okay, two hydrogen to one oxygen, always the case. Constant composition um, means that no matter the source, and they're very similar to definite proportions, um, it's the same elemental composition. Doesn't matter if it's water from the Nile River or water from the Stones River, it's still H2O in the same elemental composition. And the law of multiple portions kind of gets at that if we have like two elements that form two different compounds, um, they'll actually be a recognizable ratio once you know what that ratio is you can understand it so for instance here if we now know that you know oxygen weighs 16 and carbon 12 so effectively the ratio is 12 to 16 we can reduce that to a smaller number but that's okay then that means that co2 if we see a ratio of 12 to 32 we now know that there's two oxygens that's the way some of the early compounds formulas were deduced understanding this idea of law of multiple proportions. So this is the, what's introduced in your textbook. And once again, don't, don't, don't think that these, these videos, this is supposed to be complete and that if you're not understanding everything I'm saying that you're, you're behind or lost. That's not the case here. 
This is really just to get you thinking about the material, get you reading the textbook, and coming into the classroom a little bit more prepared than just walking in blindly. Okay, so here's this COAST framework now. And what this is is simply collect, organize, analyze, solve, and think about it. I'm going to stop there. If this works for you, great, then use it. If not, and you've got your own system, just ignore it. Okay, classes and properties of matter. So one thing we want to talk about is intensive versus extensive properties. Intensive properties are independent of the amount of material, where extensive are dependent on the amount of material. So what would be an example, if you will, then, of an, inten an, an intensive property? Well, what about density? You can see the density of a substance is the mass per unit volume. That's actually the way we define density. That's independent of the amount of material you have. The ratio is the same. And that's how much matter is packed into a given space. Um, but actual mass, if you will, that would be an extensive property because the mass that you have is dependent on the amount of material that you have. And that's pretty obvious. So those would be two examples. Then we have things like physical properties and chemical properties. Physicals, physical properties can be measured or observed without changing the substance. So you should realize, and then we can also talk about in the same breath, physical change and chemical change. You should realize if I take a pot of water and I boil it, it becomes water vapor. It's still H2O. We haven't chemically changed it. So its boiling point, if you will, is a physical property. And if I boil water, it goes through a physical change. It's still H2O. Chemical, and you can come up with a lot of examples of, of, of physical properties. Density would be another one, melting point. Chemical properties are a little bit more difficult to come up with. The classic one is always flammability. And that's a word that everybody knows. I'm not going to go into the oxidation now. When you burn something, it's no longer the same. You know that. I mean, if you burn a log, it's no longer the wood that it was before. You're left with, you know, gas that were given off, smoke that was given off, ashes in the fire. The substance has changed. So you can measure something's flammability, how readily it burns, if you will. That would be a chemical property. If you burn something, it's going through a chemical change. It's important to distinguish those. Molecules and compounds. Once again, these are pretty simple concepts that I want you to get mainly from the book. The one I will point here out here is the one at the bottom, which is ions, and maybe some people aren't familiar with what ions are, but basically um, ions have charge. Okay, we'll explain that in more detail, what that means at a later time. I mean, in classroom. Um, but that's the main thing. Now, molecules, if you will, make up the, the compounds. Right? Because they have more than one atom. Therefore, if you will, the molecule is composed of multiple elements, and there it's a compound. And atoms make up your elements. Okay? So if I have the element sulfur, it's made up of a bunch of atoms. If I have the compound water, it's made up of a bunch of molecules of water. The one thing people get confused with sometimes is that some of our elements are actually molecules in their fundamental state. And let's take hydrogen gas, for instance. Hydrogen gas is two hydrogens bound together, or H2. This, of course, is a molecule. It's not a compound because it's only composed of one element, but it is a molecule. So the element is actually made up of molecules of hydrogen gas as opposed to individual atoms. I mean, it still has hydrogen atoms. They're just bound together in pairs. We call this a homogeneous diatom. Diatom meaning two atoms, homogeneous meaning the same. That's just one thing that, that people do get a little confused about I wanted to point out. But ions basically be, can be negative or positive, positively charged. Okay. Then we go on to things like mixtures. And mixtures differ from a compound by the fact that a mixture can be separated into its components by physical methods. Remember, a compound cannot be separated by physical methods. So that's one of the key differences. A compound cannot be separated into its elements by physical means. Only physical means. So, uh, and then it can be homogeneous and heterogeneous, and exactly what the words mean. Homogeneous being the same, heterogeneous meaning kind of uh, non-uniform. So, 
homogeneous we think of being uniform, heterogeneous being non-uniform. So, you know, like salad dressing, the oil and water, uh, the oil and vinegar separate. So that would be heterogeneous. Um, you know, uh, um, by looking at it, you know, a, a, a glass of Gatorade looks pretty homogeneous, right? There's no real separation. If something's immiscible, there's another term, doesn't dissolve. Um, and I don't like to use that. We'll talk about that when we get to a section on solubility that's really more Gen Chem 2. But everything dissolves in everything. Um, when we say it does not dissolve, we means it does not dissolve to any appreciable extent, really. So here's a flow chart that brings that all together. All of matter. Can it be separated by physical processes? Mixture? No. If no, pure substance. Then here's my homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. And here's vinegar by itself and then salad dressing with the examples. Pure substances. Can it be decomposed by a chemical process? Yes, then it's a compound. No, then it must be an element like pure gold, which is just made up of gold atoms. Of course, ice or water would be made up of hydrogen and oxygen, so we can separate those out. Of course, the states of matter, that's pretty pretty basic and straightforward. I'll allow you to read on that. Um, and here's the transition of those states. The only one you might not be that familiar with is sublimation. And that is a solid going directly to a gas. So there's ice cubes in your fridge. If you leave them there for a really long time, you go to get them and they're really small. Well, that's because it's converted to gas and it's sublimated. This is the metric system. And I need you to start getting familiar with this if you're not familiar with it already. What I've done is highlight here the main prefixes you will use in general chemistry. There might be a few others that pop up on smart work questions, on homework questions in the back of the book, but I'll pretty much stick with these when it comes to exam questions, and these are the main ones you'll see used in Gen Chem. Start getting familiar with those. Now let's talk about measurements, and this will be more important in lab than it is in lecture, but um, you know we, we have different instruments and they, they measure to different degrees of, of, of precision. Um, and when we have a measurement, we always think of that last digit, if you will. It's kind of the one that's uncertain, if you will. Okay, now this one here, I shouldn't have highlighted that there, because this is actually an exact conversion. This is exact, this one particular one. Um, but 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 uh, when we do a measurement, let's take a look at an actual measurement here. Oh, wait, I guess that's on another slide. Um, so let's just say for right now, the last digit is that one that's uncertain. Now let's just leave it at that right now. After I talk about precision and accuracy, we'll get to that. So there's two different things here when we talk about data in a lab and reporting on papers and uh, reporting your data is accuracy and pre precision. Accuracy is based on the closeness of the measured value to the true value. Now, that true value is not always known, obviously, but if you know it, it's, it is an indication how close you are to that, where precision is kind of really how reproducible your data is. Okay, the best example I've ever seen is like darts thrown at a dartboard. So here's my three dartboards. And here's my bullseye in the middle. Okay? Now, we're going to assume the bullseye is the true value. Let's say that, you know, we have an EPA standard that's been sent to us, and there's a known concentration of lead in the water. And we're going to analyze on, on our instruments and see what we come up with and how close it is to the standard that EPA prepared for us. And then we know how accurate and precise our lab is, is functioning. So let's say I get a bunch of, of measurements, and they're like this. Four measurements, Okay. And then another scenario, I get a bunch like this. And another scenario, I get a bunch like this. Okay, this first set over here, these are accurate because they're very close to the true value, but they're also precise because they're all grouped together. Okay, so each measurement I do is very close to the previous measurement. These over here are precise, but they're not accurate. Actually, left the C out of my original accurate over here. But they're not accurate. These are not precise and not accurate. Let's 
see the difference. And if you have non-precise, non-accurate data, um, then who knows what's going on? You're just a bad scientist, or you got lots of problems in the lab. If you have data like this, it usually means that there's something systematically wrong. Like, say your scale's off. Oh, and that's why I'm getting, you know, all of them. They're still all close together. If I fix my scale and calibrate my scale, now they're all going to be grouped around the true value. So that's the difference between accuracy and pre precision. Now we get into significant figures. And that last digit I was talking about. Um, so let's say we have a scale here and we're measuring something. And in one case, it gives us this value. And this refers to an actual figure in your book, so you can look at that. And in the other case, you get this value. And the idea is the second one here is is much more precise because it gives me a better indication of possibly the, that accurate, I mean, that actual uh, mass. Um, so even though that last digit is, is um, questionable, this we still say has three sig figs or three significant figures. That's what my shorthand for fi significant figures is. This has one, two, three, four, five sig figs. I'll explain how you can figure out the number of sig figs. For right now, just counting those is sufficient. So the second one, obviously, is better. We have greater certainty in the second measurement. And actually, I just realized that is the last slide. So we'll spend a lot of time in class talking about significant figures and um, doing examples and showing you how you can use them in calculations so you'll be prepared for lab. We'll also do example calculations on conversions and lots of things like that. So that concludes your first video, and I will see you in class.